Welcome and happy birthday to Kim Frimpong. This is from Norm Falong and uh, here at TV3. But we told you earlier that the finance minister will be in parliament today to present the mid-year uh, review of his budget statement. I've been joined by two gentlemen. Professor Albert Spuni is with the Corporate Governance Leadership and Business Administration uh, Unit of the UPSA, the University of Professional Studies is here. Prof, welcome. Thank, Thank you very you much very for your much. time. And so Dr. George Domfe is also a senior research fellow in development economy, development economist, I beg your pardon, at the University of Ghana. Doc, welcome. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. I like the way you're blending the grades. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> the, the academicians are blending the grades. <laughs> yeah, the broadcasters <laughs> will keep to their blue black. Uh -huh. anyway. But but the finance minister will be in parliament today. What key expectations uh, do we have? I'll start with you, Prof. Okay, I, I think that uh, generally the, the the budget for 2019, the, he came out with certain figures uh, that uh, looking at the, the main crisis to create jobs and prosperity mm -hmm. and then looking at the uh, infrastructure driven programs mm -hmm. and then looking at revenue looking at how to bring the debt down. Now, we have to ask whether those targets that were set, we are on course, because we are in the media, and then we should be on course looking at the target that was set. Mm. So I am looking at where we are now, where we said we would be, okay. and then we find out the, the issues that are not making us get to where we want to be. So I'm looking at the minister telling us about how they are mobilizing revenue, mm. how the projects that they said, they will, the infrastructure driven project, mm. how the projects are being handled now, mm. and then debt, how we are bringing the debt down. Mm. So those are the things that I will be looking at for. Right. We are now going to prove where we are now and then where we said we were going to be at the beginning of the year. Right. Yeah. Doc, how about you? Uh, what are your expectations for today? Uh, yeah, thank you very much uh, for this opportunity once again to talk about Ghana. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes, uh, I, as Pro rightly put it, uh, so uh, before we enter this year, mm -hmm. um, they told us a lot about what um, they want this country to be managed mm -hmm. um, throughout the, the the rest of 2019, mm -hmm. and uh, we we so far gone through uh, almost seven months, mm -hmm. and so now we need to be told that the targets that they set for themselves. For example, they said the economy should be growing at 7.6 mm -hmm. percent at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. They said um, inflation should be 8 percent, mm -hmm. and this is something I've never heard about. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, you know, the lowest we had uh, was in the region of 8 percent, but it was more than 8, I mean, 8 in, in 2012. And so when I hear that we are expecting um, inflation to go down to 8 percent, I said, wow. Yeah, uh, what is more, they also say that the fiscal deficit, they'll manage it at 4.2. Mm -hmm. This is uh, because of the, um, I mean, the law that they have brought in a way to protect the public pace. Uh, uh, I'm talking about the fiscal, um, I mean, responsibility. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, so with that kind of act, we are not supposed to spend over 5%. We, know, we are not mm -hmm. supposed to incur 5% um, of uh, you know, deficit of yeah, the, the GDP. And so now they're saying they want to, uh, you know, manage it around 4.2. Mm -hmm. Yes, we are looking forward to see that. Again, they say uh, at, at the end of the year, import export cover okay. should be uh, at, three, at least 3.5 months. Mm -hmm. we, we want to be told whether we are getting closer. And our mind worry is also about the expenditure. The expenditure, they put it around uh, 73 billion mm -hmm. and uh, they, uh, they also told us that we, we are going to generate uh, 58.9 billion Ghana cities mm -hmm. uh, and so there's going to be a gap and that's what is going to reflect the the, the fiscal deficit of 4.2 mm -hmm. um, we, we want to be told that whether the revenue target of our 58.9 billion we are getting closer mm -hmm. and if we are not getting closer is the expenditure going to be reviewed downwards? Because uh, if we are not getting the revenue targets and then you don't revise the expenditure downwards, it means that you will not get your fiscal deficit. Mm -hmm. 
And so these are some of the things that we expect. Interesting. To do. Let's delve deeper, maybe, and, and now look at because you both spoke about revenue uh, mobilization. Let's now look at uh, one of the key things that brought about a lot of you and cry the luxury vehicle uh, tax. Uh, some have called that, well, kick it out because we, even the finance minister confessed that it couldn't generate as much as they had anticipated would generate. Prof, direct question to you. Should the luxury vehicle tax stay or should it go? I think it's... If you look at it, there is a sector also in the hiring, car hiring sector who normally depend on these luxury cars. Mm. So that sector started making a lot of noise that mm. the policy is likely to collapse their sector. Right. So I think that looking at that sector, the minister would like to see whether we can. But I, I seriously think that if you really want to bring in revenue, Mm. That sector cannot give us so much impact. Mm. Seriously, if you if you look at luxury cars and then you say you are going to increase the luxury cars to certain percentage, you would like to have the sector having a very huge effect mm. on the revenue that is going to bring up. But I don't I don't seriously believe that. If you look at it, the minister raised the luxury tax and reduced import. Right. So. The knockdown effect to you, it's actually leveling it. Because if you if you increase luxury tax mm -hmm. and then at the low side of it, we will reduce it, mm -hmm. you get revenue here. The, the benchmark. The bench, yeah, the, but the revenue too that you are expecting to get from imports mm -hmm. has been also reduced. So we don't even have any effect of increasing the luxury tax. Mm -hmm. So I think that looking at that sector which is going to suffer and then they are complaining that if you have reduced the import benchmark then we should also have something so i think uh, looking at it you should reduce it and you see innovative ways mm. of bringing broad-based policies okay. that will bring in much more revenue than this small aspect of luxury uh, cars i mean how many people normally will i know Ghanaians like luxury cars but right. you ask yourself how many is it going to bring in mm. if we look at the numbers and it's very good that we can maintain it if it's not so good then it's going to kill some other sector that rely on that sector of luxury cars then it has no effect but i think the basic thing is reducing the import that has actually bring has no effect. It's leveled everything yeah, yeah, yeah. to, to right. back to the status quo. Mm -hmm. But Doc, the, the key question also has been raised about luxury vehicles and the fact that some persons who have a truck um, supposed to be loading cassava from one point to the other is considered a luxury vehicle because of its fuel consumption and the size of the engine. But in the strict sense of the word, he doesn't use it for luxury until... So, on, that, on the strength of that, I'm asking, would you share Prof's thoughts on this luxury vehicle debate? Yeah, thank you very much. I think Thursday, I, I mean, uh, I spoke on this network on the luxury tax. When we talk about luxury tax, my understanding of it is that um, you want to say that uh, certain people are enjoying so much, you know, they have so much, and so we want them to pay you know, more, okay. you know, because uh, as I sit here, if mm -hmm. you ask me to pay 100 cities uh, to anybody, I don't think it will affect me so much. But if you go down there to the, to meet a car lady and you ask her to pay 100 cities, it's going to be a problem. And so if you ask me to pay more because I get more, mm -hmm. th there's nothing wrong with it. Right. Yeah, but I want to say that the, the way and manner uh, that uh, this particular uh, whole thing came, mm -hmm. I think uh, it, it wasn't built on the right premises. How so? Let me say the research uh, they did that brought the whole thing, mm -hmm. I think was uh, was not good. Mm -hmm. I have serious problem with the definition of a luxury car. <laughs> uh, the definition, they got it very wrong. Mm -hmm. I would have expected that the luxury should have been related to the cost of the vehicle okay. instead of the engine capacity. Mm -hmm. If you have uh, a car registered A, 
I mean, you know, and uh, it has been in the system for over 20 years, and mm. the engine capacity is over five. Okay. And uh, do you call such a car luxury? <laughs> but some people have uh, cars with engine capacity of two, right, or even below. Mm. And uh, such cars are are very expensive. Absolutely. You know, mm. and so those are they should have looked at the cost instead of the engine capacity, and so they got it wrong there. And if they want to review it, then they should look at the cost of the vehicle mm. instead of a. Uh, uh, you know, because cars that are very expensive are large cars in, in sort of the engine capacity. And um, when they started, uh, as Prof. Riley put it, it hasn't raised in so much revenue mm -hmm. as anticipated because the so called large cars, cars with the uh, uh, engine capacity as uh, 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 you know, qualified mm -hmm. to be in that uh, bracket, are, are mostly uh, the government vehicles, <laughs> right? They are mo mostly an um, NGO. You know, and so you could clearly see that uh, they are they are not getting in much, mm. uh, and uh, certain businesses are also collapsing. And so I think uh, uh, I expect the finance minister mm. uh, to say to review it by redefining luxury cars mm. uh, to 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 say uh, the cost mm. instead of what the engine capacity. Otherwise, they have to scrap it. I don't think uh, it's a it's a. It's, it's, it's good tax. Okay, let's listen to the finance minister, Mr. Ken Oforieta, uh, speaking about this subject. The law stipulates vehicles with engine capacities of between 3.0 to 3.5 liters will attract an annual tax of 1,000 Ghana cities. Those with engine capacities of 3.6 to 4.0 liters will pay 1,500 Ghana cities annually, while 4.1 liters and above are to pay an annual tax of 2,000 Ghana cities. The government at the time said the move was to raise more revenue by taxing the wealthy a little more. The law has been criticized by car dealers and vehicle importers, arguing that it has increased their cost of doing business. According to the finance minister, the media review would be presented before July 31 this year with a review of the luxury vehicle tax. Anytime you bring something new, you need to be able to make the assessment that you are talking about. You have all sorts of variables. Whatever it is, it's been nine months. We, we want to assess its impact. We want to assess the name. We want to see whether the capacity is an issue. We want to see whether the pricing is an issue. So all of that uh, will, will come to play. I mean, we will listen and then we'll look at the analysis. Even though the minister did not disclose the form in which the review will take, he maintained that significant changes will be made to the law. And then a run-up to the finance minister appearing before parliament to uh, give us a media review of what the budget for 2019 is. Let's take a look at what the luxury uh, tax on vehicles actually means. Well, the levy is as follows. It's uh, the 292950 uh, CC and uh, 3549 CC will have to pay a thousand Ghana cities. Now, uh, 3550 CC or 4049 CC will have to pay 1500 cities. Above uh, any of that, will have to pay 2000 cities. Now, the levy paid on registration of vehicles and subsequently on or before the annual renewal of that same uh, registration will, will, will attract that. The second slide will talk about the vehicles that are exempt from paying those figures, tractors, ambulances, commercial vehicles that have the capacity to transport more than 10 persons, commercial vehicles for the transport of goods, and uh, all the issues in between. That, that's according to the Minister for Finance, Mr. Ken Oforiata. So this is it as it stands. But the, with the admission by the Minister for Finance that they have not been able to generate as much as they had thought about uh, generating and the fact that the experts have also been speaking, you heard Doc and Professor, should it go? Should it stay? Your thoughts on social media are most important. And uh, the academicians here have said that, well, if it is not working, yeah, <laughs> either review it or take it, take it off. But, but Doc, the, the target also was set, 7.6% uh, GDP growth was set. We have not seen the figures as will be presented today, but we do know that some of the figures have been churned out already. Are we on the right path? Or are we losing out again? Okay, so talking about the GDP, 
Uh, yes, uh, so that is uh, the rate at which um, economic activities uh, grow. Mm. What you do, what I do, and what everybody else does, uh, are we doing better? And so that is the GDP growth rate. And um, um, over the last few years, uh, we have seen the GDP growth rate uh, improving. Um, some years, uh, it was rather, uh, you know, it took a nose diving trend, I must say, and today uh, it has picked up. Mm. It's been going. And so last year, we had a GDP growth of 6.3%. Okay. Now, uh, when we had 6.3%, at the end of the first quarter, mm -hmm. the economy was growing at 5.4%. You know, usually during the first and second quarters, uh, many economic activities are, are, are not brought on the stream. Mm -hmm. You talk about the agricultural produce; they normally would uh, come um, or be captured by the by the GDP. I mean, you know, estimation in the last two quarters, that is the third and fourth quarter. And so, usually in the first quarter, the agricultural sector doesn't do well. And so, if you look at last year. At the end of the first quarter, the economy was growing at 5.4, mm -hmm. and we ended up getting 6. Okay. And this year, we are looking, the target is 7.6. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the first quarter, that is um, 31st March mm -hmm. ending, the economy was growing at 6.7. Okay. It, 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 it gives a clear um, indication that uh, we will meet the target 6.6. .6. What is it that uh, this government is doing, which would make it, for example, uh, give it the impetus to achieve that that five point uh, something you mentioned in the first quarter, which is quite unusual, if you ask. Uh, what what are they doing special? Uh, yes. Uh, so if you look at the agricultural sector, it wasn't doing so well some time ago, mm. and um, but now agricultural sector has picked up. It is doing very well, except that during the first quarter of the year, um, it slowed. The growth slowed. Mm. It grew by. 2.2 percent mm -hmm. and at the 2.2 percent growth rate for agricultural sector we saw livestock uh, you know subsector doing very well growing at 5.5 and that's mm -hmm. high mm -hmm. because sub uh, livestock and crop production normally would grow around one percent mm -hmm. and so i think that this time we we we, we are very serious with livestock production and so it is yielding a um, dividend mm -hmm. let me also say that the uh, agricultural sector as a whole uh, wasn't doing so well uh, um, for, I mean, in the past five years, we were even getting negative in some years. And last 0 .04 year, zero point zero four percent and all of that. Yeah, if last call. year you saw the agricultural sector picking up and growing at six point one percent, that was uh, remarkable. Mm -hmm. um, and what was more, the food, uh, you know, food production has, you know, been improved. And as a result of that, if you look at the inflation today, the food component mm. is the reason, main reason why prices are going down. Mm. And so, uh, agricultural sector is doing very well, mm. I might say. And um, if you, uh, apart from agricultural sector, mm. uh, I'm yet to hear a year the manufacturing sector grew over nine percent. Mm. Last year, manufacturing sector, Ghanaian manufacturing sector, grew nine percent, mm. and, uh, and 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 that has, in a way. Uh, had, uh, has helped the CD to stabilize. I was telling, uh, I was sharing the joke that if you look at what happened to the CD in, during the first quarter of the year, mm. had it not been for the fact that manufacturing sector did so well, and of course we also registered a uh, trade uh, surplus, mm. I mean, it would have been, uh, you know, serious. Mm. The CD would have, you know, mm. and so the manufacturing sector is doing very well. But let mm. me quickly say that um, one of the main reason why the economy is also growing is, uh, is the oil. Okay. The oil, uh, I mean, oil prices have gone up. Mm. Um, you know, today a barrel is sold at around sixty dollars. Mm. You know, per barrel. I mean, I'm sixty dollars per barrel for right. yeah on, on, on the I mean international, uh, international market, and that's very good. What is more, today we are producing more the quantity. Mm. We've increased the, I mean, uh, you know, you know the production since mm. 2017. And let me say that uh, it was the previous government mm. that that did all that. When we when you want to look at the, I mean, they, but they minus, discovered minus oil, the yeah, government discovered, is, is targeting that we'll get some six point two percent. Yeah. yeah. So they they discovered some oil flows and we started the production in 2017. Mm. And since then, it has added it added on to what we were doing. And today we are producing so many barrels. And apart from the quantity that has gone up, um, international. Uh, you know, market price for oil has also shot up, and okay. that to me is uh, is also helping very well. But but as you rightly put it, mm. minus oil, the economy is still doing well because of the manufacturing sector and the I mean, agricultural sector. Okay, let's take a look at this story. When we return, Prof will have a bite on this matter, and uh, we'll we'll see you after this. The first quarter gross domestic product, GDP, 
for 2019 showed the agriculture sector recorded a growth rate of 2.2 percent in spite of the various interventions by government such as planting for food and jobs and the one district one warehouse government statistician professor samuel kwabna enim spoke on the agriculture sector during the release of the gdp figures within the agri sector Although we continue to experience an increase in absolute terms, we see that the growth rate has dropped from 3.4% to 2.2%. This does not mean that within the agri sector it has contracted. Within the agri sector, we still see, in terms of absolute terms, an increase, but the rate at which the growth that we experience over the last five years has decreased by 1.2%. CEO of the Institute of Chartered Economists, Ghana, Gideon Emisa, observed the slow growth in the agriculture sector can be attributed to lack of long-term plan. He expects the finance minister to address that challenge in the mid-year budget review. You would realize that agriculture has seen a lot of policies when it comes to this administration example planting for food and jobs and planting for food and exports um, one district one warehouse one village one dam so there's been a lot of policies that come from um, the, the ministry of agriculture unfortunately um, it's not reflecting in the numbers as far as statistics is concerned um, i think that because we we don't have a long-term plan where we would sit with this short to medium term uh, programs and projects within, it could be a major factor. Uh, otherwise, we would be embarking on some knee-jerk approach and when it comes, we just uh, jump in and then implement those policies. He suggested agriculture modernization needs to be taken to a high level. One may be aware of some uh, support coming from the World Bank and other external you know, institutions to support us in mechanizing and um, in terms of irrigation and agricultural modernization so we, we've 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 taken some huge steps in that direction but there's still more work to be done in that area it's a, it's a factor for which we are seeing some of the things that we're seeing right now And that was uh, Ebenezer Jacob's report that the Institute of Chartered Economic uh, Economists of Ghana have been speaking. But let's turn our attention now to Prof. Papuni. Prof, so the, the agreement is that during the first half of, of the year, a great dips, yeah. and then the second half, it, it bounces yeah. up. Yeah. But then this year, we've seen a, a bit of a change in, in, that, uh, in that trend. I'm asking, if a Greek is really growing, uh, why are we not reaping the the benefits in terms of, for example, value addition and to export and to rake in more cash? We are growing so much, and yet we don't have so much to show that we're growing so much. Why? I think we have introduced programs, uh, food for planting and those kind of things, but we need to really look at the supply chain and like what the news mm -hmm. item is saying, modernize by bringing in a lot of processing of, 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 of the agricultural products. Right. If you look at it, our agriculture is still rain-fed. Mm -hmm. So the first quarters where you are coming from the Hamatan, mm -hmm. you don't get a lot of rains. Okay. Now the rains are in, mm -hmm. and then from the third and fourth quarter, you see farmers harvesting, wow. and then it will pick up. Mm -hmm. What we need to do with the food for planting the job is to also look at how to do aggressive processing, mm. making sure that we are able to transform the raw into semi-finished or mm. process and then do the export. Okay. If we don't add value to it, mm. then it will be the pattern will be like that for a very long time. So I think that the agricultural ministry has done very well. Mm. However, we need to look at integrating whatever we are doing with other sectors, industrialization, uh, roads, mm. because they are all linked together. Right. So if you are thinking about agriculture, it's not just about planting mm. and then making sure that the programs are there. How are they linked to other sectors mm. so that when we 
harvest, mm -hmm. we can process, we can transport, mm -hmm. we can look at quality, mm -hmm. we can mechanizing. All these things are very integrated. And I think that we need, seriously, we have started the program, but we need to integrate mm -hmm. and then make sure that it affects the other six, uh, sectors and it's linked to the, together. The, the, the government had a vision of uh, one district, one factory to, yeah. to push forward some of this uh, agenda. In your opinion, how has that done? And you know, what do you see happening in the also distant future? The government has just about one year to go. <laughs> yeah, I mean, things like that, you don't expect to yield a very short-term result. Mm. Uh, uh, manufacturing takes a lot of time. I was. I was talking to Doc and I was telling him that Ghanaians, we, the government should manage the expectations mm -hmm. because you started a, prog a program of industrialization. Okay, industrialization mm -hmm. takes some time before you can reap the benefit. Mm -hmm. You look at how you are going to set up a factory mm -hmm. and then the other connected issues that are related to it. So they have started, but they need to link the food for planting a job too. Mm -hmm. So if we are looking at planting tomatoes, okay. how are we setting factories mm -hmm. that will process that tomatoes? Okay. How are we linking roots to that place? Okay. How are we training agriculture uh, extension, extension officers mm -hmm. to be closer to the farming areas? Mm -hmm. These are things that are very integrated. And I think that they have started, but I need to see more connection between mm -hmm what we are doing in agriculture and in that of industrialization mm. and even with the roads it will it should inform us the kind of roads mm. that we have to construct right because we are looking at modernizing our agri mm. coming out with irrigation and those kind of things mm. we should be connected mm. it should be connected and we when we connect it mm. we can make a very good uh, results out of it. Mm. I think if you go to countries like Israel where they look at the enclave system, mm -hmm. so you have the agriculture enclave something like uh, uh, for vegetables mm. and then it is connected with a lot of industries. Mm -hmm. Okay, so from the harvest it goes to transport, it goes to marketing. You feed everybody. To, yes, mm. so that is what we need to be doing and I, I i would like to see how the government is able to connect mm. so that this program that they have started is mm. well integrated and then to affect the economy Doc, you are the development economist why why is this we have the plan we know what to do why aren't we doing it what is keeping us from doing it yeah thank you very much uh, but uh, i there was something on the group okay. that i wanted right. to right. talk about uh, normally it's not so much to say the economy is growing at 10 percent 15 percent i think uh, we all we want to see if it is growing who mm -hmm. is being affected who right. in ghana mm -hmm. is being affected and that's very very important and so um when you are talking about the growth you you look at the the sector okay uh, i mean the various sectors and ghana we have three sectors i was talking about the agricultural sector mm -hmm. that um uh, when at the end of the first quarter, when the whole economy mm. grew 6.7 percent, agricultural sector grew 2.2 percent, mm. and I, I said that uh, the main group, the agricultural sector group, was uh, mm. uh, uh, you know was influenced uh, largely by the growth in the livestock production. And I, uh, in Ghana, the core poor are the livestock producers, and so if you see the livestock. Uh, doing very well and the crop doing well, mm -hmm. then it, it, we can describe such a growth as well, pro poor. Okay. Then when we take the industrial sector, the industrial sector, um, the, the sector that did very well was mining and quarrying mm -hmm. because of the oil. Right. The, the, the industrial sector also grew by 7.2 mm -hmm. and the mining and quarrying grew by 20 percent and okay. so you could see that the whole uh, growth at the industrial sector was led by money and inquiry, and that's not good enough mm -hmm. because the money and inquiry um, doesn't create jobs. Right. Manufacturing sector creates, creates jobs, jobs, and that brings in the industrial sector mm -hmm. thing that I'm Prof is talking about. Right. The manufacturing sector creates jobs. At the moment, we are told over 300, I'm much more concerned about job creation. We are told that over 300,000 um, Ghanaians join the labor force every mm -hmm. year. And Ghana government has capacity to employ only 5,000, mm. leaving over 295,000 for the private sector to, mm. to uh, um, engage. And so the private sector, I want to talk about the private sector, we're talking about the manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. If the manufacturing sector is not doing well, employed to absorb these people, mm. then we are talking about, I mean, you know, unemployment 
higher unemployment rates and these attendant, you know, problems like armed robbery, prostitution, and all those things. And so, um, the money, during the first quarter of the year, manufacturing sector didn't do so well. What is even very worrying with, with the first quarter growth was the construction. Okay. Construction uh, was growing negatively, around negative six. Mm. And if you are, your construction is growing negative six, what it means is that uh, you, you are not investing much mm. into tomorrow. Construction is about buildings, about building roads, about building hospitals, about building schools, you know, and also the private, um, you know, construction. Mm. You know, so it, if the construction is growing at negative six, I don't think it's so the somebody, best. Somebody says that, well, the government is not spending to allow for the private sector to... To, to, for it to open up for the private sector to get in debt, and is that, is that what it is? Uh, uh, government uh, isn't spending enough, so the private sector is. Yes, and is so also if hit. the rules are not, if we, get, yeah, government normally will spend on rules, construction, mm -hmm. and you know, other things, and during our uh, election year, <laughs> that way we, we know where, <laughs> the, you know, but, uh, but so I think, uh, yes, uh, partly true because uh, the construction. Uh, it has slowed down, and during the year we were told that uh, uh, we were going to do a lot of, uh, you know, we were going to see massive infrastructure mm. developments, and that we haven't seen that at least not in the what? first quarter, mm. you know. And then you move to um, the tertiary, mm. the tertiary telecommunication and communication. Sorry, um, I mean information and from, uh, and, and, and communication, communication subsector. Yeah, okay. This so well. I'm talking about information and communication okay, subsector. It did so well, it grew by 37%. And um, the rest of the sectors, I mean, subsectors, didn't do well. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't have problem with the I mean, information and communication mm -hmm. subsector. It creates a lot of jobs. Mm -hmm. If you move around, you see the mobile money, you know, people, a lot of people are working, right. you know. So that is, I don't have much problem when it comes to job creation. My worry has been with the ownership. Okay. Who, owns Who owns that it. sector? It's, it's largely foreign owned. Okay. And if you see the front page of this paper, Ghana highly exposed to capital flight. Mm -hmm. And so we are not saying people shouldn't come and invest in this country, but uh, we also must make effort mm -hmm. to also own some of these businesses. The otherwise, otherwise the, it, uh, this economy is doing well. Mm -hmm. It's partly because uh, you have um, uh, um, information and communication subsector growing 37 percent. I don't know the day is the, the money is not for again. They, 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 they will now take it away. And one serious thing about it is that when they have to take it away, uh, they do it in dollars, mm -hmm. and that has adverse consequences for you for the strength of your city, right? Mm -hmm. And so the capital flight is also a problem. So, so someone says government is asking us not to transact business in dollars and they are quoting <laughs> figures in dollars. So like, but, but quickly, I think we'll, we'll take a break shortly, but tell me, I, I was asking a question, Prof had listed certain things mm -hmm. that should be connected to a Greek to yeah. ensure that we're raking in more. And I'm asking, if we know this, why aren't we doing it? Yeah, what we, is keeping us from yeah, so doing we it? So never, we never did that because uh, uh, agricultural sector, those countries that have developed in Europe and other places, I think I've said it, this one even here before, uh, how to move from the primary sector. The primary sector is the agricultural sector. Then you go to the secondary sector, that is the uh, industrial sector, the manufacturing and, you know, construction and, you know, water production and all that. I mean, electricity, that is the industrial. Mm -hmm. And then you move to the tertiary. Ghana from 1957 all the way to 2005, agricultural sector, that is the primary sector, was the leading contributor to our GDP. Mm -hmm. That was the mainstay of the um, economy. Then from two, two, um, 2006, mm -hmm. tertiary then picked it up and tertiary became the leading contributor to the um, GDP, which meant that from primary school, we didn't go to secondary, <laughs> we, we, we moved to um, um, tertiary. Mm -hmm. And that's why the economy had been, you know, I mean, struggling. And so we need to go back, pick, pick bits and pieces, mm -hmm. and work on the industrial. And I might say this government is doing very well when it comes to that, okay. because um, they have policies to improve the agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. they, they also have policies such as uh, one district, one factory, mm -hmm. and all that to also ensure that the manufacturing sector does well. So the agricultural sector will grow to feed the manufacturing, you know, subsector. Mm -hmm. And as it does well, that will, you know, also push the services sector. So it is from the primary to the secondary to the te um, tertiary. tertiary. But let me say that one Quickly. thing, one thing that is, uh, um, I mean, that's a problem. And even one of the reasons why the one district, one factory is not working so well is the cost of credit. <laughs> Mm. It's so high, lending rate so high in this country. As we speak, policy rate is 16 percent. Yes, it used to be about 25.5 um, some time ago. It has it has declined to 16, mm. which is very good. But the, the rate at which um, the lending rates and the others are coming down, 
I mean, they are not moving uh, with, 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 with that speed. Mm -hmm. And so lending rate is very high. And I tell you, um, to, to go into manufacturing, you need interest rate of not, not anywhere near 10 percent, below 10 percent. Mm. And if you have your policy rate at 16 percent, no bank can give anything to you uh, and below 16 percent once the policy rate is set at 16 percent. Mm. And so that makes cost of credit so high in this country. Okay, and that's part of the reason why manufacturing sector and the whole of the industrial sector is not doing well. Prof, somebody told me yesterday that, yeah. well, if uh, the credit, credit rate is up like that and people are not producing, when you graduate people with marketing degrees, what are they going to sell? <laughs> That's a big problem. I think what are they going to sell if nobody is, is, is <laughs> yes, I think, producing? I think like Doug is saying, you need to come from primary to secondary to mm -hmm. tertiary. What we are seeing now is that we've moved straight to tertiary. Mm -hmm. We need to really develop the primary. Okay. Look, agriculture will be the main employer for a very long time to come. Okay. So we need to put in more the programs and I'm saying that we should link it very well. Mm. I am very happy that they've come out with policies that mm. are ensuring that the agriculture sector is at least growing from where we're looking at. Mm. But we need to do more. What is not happening is that mm. you know the banking sector had this cleanup. Mm. So the banking sector if you look at the service sector the banking sector didn't grow. It didn't. It didn't. Now we added microfinance. Uh, yes. So the credit also is having problems because the banking sector generally is actually having, we are now recovering. Okay, we are now recovering from mm. the cleanup. Okay. So it need to, the government need to also focus on that, build the confidence in the financial sector so that the financial sector can grow back. Okay. And then sometimes some of the credit can be channeled into the primary and the secondary. Okay, we'll take a break now. Professor Albert Puni is with the University of Professional Studies in Accra, and uh, Dr. Domfe is also with the University of Ghana, he's a senior lecturer. When we return from the break, there are other areas that we'll be looking at, for example, in the matter of uh, revenue mobilization and the digitization of our tax regime, the paperless system at the port and all of that. Remember the town hall meeting by the vice president where some tax cuts were announced, the impacts? We'll talk about them. Welcome back. Uh, it's a special coverage of the media review uh, of uh, the budget by the finance minister. Mr. Ken of Riata would happen in parliament later today, but we're having pre conversations about it. My guess that uh, Professor Albert Puni is with the University of Professional Studies, and uh, Dr. Domfe, Dr. George Domfe, is also a senior lecturer at the University of Ghana Business School, University of Ghana. And, uh, but let's turn our attention now to Aisha Yakubu. She's got some messages on our WhatsApp call so far. Aisha, good morning. Hello, John. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you? Great. What are your expectations for today? Um, we all just can't wait uh, mm. for what's to come. Just like our listeners, our watch, uh, viewers from home, okay. they want to know mm. what it is in store for the ordinary Ghanaians. And that's why we have to go through some of the messages sure. that they've sent to us. Fire the very first away. one is coming from Fawaz from Amasamane. He says, good morning. The minority NDC will be disappointed once again in today's mid-year review budget. NPP is a people's choice and there's no way this government will introduce any tax whatsoever to burden the plight of Ghanaians. The government continues to remember the confidence bestowed on them and it's clear that it is performing so well to meet the expectations of the citizenry. I foresee that the performance of this government will gradually collapse the dreams of having NDC as an alternative. That is what Fawaz says. Mm. Uh, Rexford from, uh, Nyako from Aguna Nyakrom says the uh, vehicle cost in Ghana keeps increasing in the country. All spare parts and accessories are high in terms of cost too. And now look at the taxpayer num on our cars. I think the cost should be reduced and also this government is really doing doing great in all sectors. Um, Farouk sent this one from Tamale and he says, good morning to you, Johnny, and to your able uh, panelist. The mid-year budget review today is going to be NPP's usual spelling out of, of their concocted figures to deceive the public. Ghanaians will no longer accept the incompetence 
from the NPP. Um, this one is from Bonti Benjamin from Achimi Bwakwa. He says, I'm optimistic that the 2019 budget review will address key issues concerning the people and mobilize revenue to champion more infrastructural development for the nation. Let's support the able Akufuado government to do more for Mother Ghana. Good morning, TV3. As we are patiently waiting for the finance minister to present the mid-year budget review later today, we expect him and his government to scrap the luxury vehicle tax and say something better about sanitation. He says he's watching us all the way from the Elubo border. Uh, this one is from Emilia from Asawasi. She says, nothing new to see in this um, sugar quoted budget to be read by the finance ministry. In fact, we only need to get ready to pay higher for all the things that we use. She says, Ghana, Brett, greetings to everyone. Ah, uh, Good morning to my senior men on the panel. The fact of the matter is that the government has done so well to implement solid policies in all sectors of the economy to ensure growth. What is left is the materialization of the policies that will create more jobs in the shortest possible time. Let's give Nanado and his government the credit for such a move. Ghana will survive again. Joseph Otu sent that one to us. Um, this one says, hmm, I bought an old pickup to enable me to go to my village and do my life, uh, livestock business. Is this pickup a luxury car? Let's redefine luxury cars. Good morning. He's, his name is Francis Xavier. Uh, he's the one that sent this one to us. Charles Nyame from Asamankesi says, Our biggest problem as a country is that uh, this NPP government who only came to amass wealth for themselves and create hardship and discomfort for the rest of Ghanaians. Now, the solution is very simple. Let's drop them come 2020 and bring back the honest, hardworking John Dramani Mahama. And the very, very last one says, good morning, TV3. In fact, let's be honest to ourselves. This government is not doing well at all. You can talk about figures, but the reality is that the people are suffering. The NPP government has borrowed more than any government, but have nothing to show for it. Derek sent that one from South Tung. And so, Johnny, those are some of the messages wow, that we've yeah, received. A mix of comments there. Shall we'll, we'll get some more and read to you later. But let's hear the finance minister, Mr. Ken Oforieta, as he spoke about the collapse of the seven banks and other issues. Take a listen to this. The Bank of Ghana has also done an excellent job in implementing monetary policy. This has resulted in inflation dropping to single digits, lower interest rates, and a relatively stable currency, despite recent turbulence in emerging markets and a strengthening US dollar, the financial system is critical to the functioning and development of the economy, and banks are central to our financial system. In addition to providing employment to a large segment of the population, the role of banks as a provider of credit and liquidity to the economy remains critical to the functioning of the economy. Mr. Speaker, weak macroeconomic conditions coupled with poor corporate governance and risk management in a number of banks over the past few years led to high levels of non-performing loans and abuse of depositors funds through related parties and affiliates in breach of regulatory requirements. In addition, the lack of enforcement of the rules contributed to liquidity and insolvency challenges in the banking sector. As a result, we inherited a number of weak banks and specialized deposit-taking institutions, savings and loans companies, finance houses, rural and community banks, and microfinance institutions. This eventually led to an assumption and consolidation of seven banks with potentially adverse consequences for depositors, creditors, employers, suppliers, and other stakeholders. It was critically important that these banks be made to exit the financial system in a timely and orderly fashion to avoid contagion for the rest of the financial system. Mr. Speaker, since the assumption of office by the current administration of the Bank of Ghana, bold measures have been taken to restore the health and resilience of the banking sector and to clamp down on our Lansing's deposit-taking financial houses.
And that was the finance minister in parliament. But there was also a question about whether or not the depositors, uh, the seven banks which had been consolidated into one, the CBG, would have their funds secured and safe for them. Here's the finance minister one more time. The government has continued to provide assurances to depositors and customers of licensed banks and specialized depositor institutions through demonstrable actions that their deposits are safe. Indeed, Following the creation of the Consolidated Bank Limited, a wholly owned government of Ghana and licensed by the Bank of Ghana as a universal bank, the government capitalized over 450 million Ghana cities. In addition, government had to issue a bond with a face value of 7.6 billion to cover the gap between the deposit liabilities and the remaining good liabilities of the five failed banks. This singular action of government has reposed confidence in the banking system because it will ensure that no deposits of the 1.2 million depositors will be lost and customers will continue to assess their deposits without difficulty. Through government's intervention in August this year, deposits of some 11 billion have been saved as well as some 2,661 jobs in addition to several hundred saved in 2017. The government's action has also created a strong indigenous Ghanaian bank in place of the five failed banks. The government is committed to ensuring that Consolidated Bank Ghana Limited becomes a strong customer-oriented indigenous bank, well positioned to meet the demands of all its customers and to serve as a go-to bank for financing small and medium-sized enterprises and corporate Ghana. Mr. Speaker, generally banks have made progress in repairing their balance sheets by writing off bad loans and addressing capital needs. Banks are far advanced in executing their plans to augment their statutory capital in line with the new minimum requirement, compliance of which is expected by end December 2018. The Bank of Ghana is also working on a comprehensive action plan for cleaning up the specialized deposit-taking institutions made up of savings and loan companies, finance houses, rural and community banks, and microfinance institutions. The government will support an orderly resolution of the difficulties and will provide the much-needed funds to facilitate prompt payouts to their depositors. Welcome back. So that was the finance minister. Now quickly I'll go to Professor Pune. Prof, did the uh, consolidation of the seven banks, and if you like following that, the microfinance companies, did they achieve the purpose it set out to achieve? People were skeptical, but the uh, matters flowing from it, the bank runs, the withdrawal syndrome that has happened, did they, did they achieve, the government achieve what they sought to achieve? I think relatively they've done very well. If you Positively look for the economy or For the economy. If, if, if we left the banking sector the way money it is, it, it could create a lot of problems. Because what the cleanup sought to address was the lapses in the regulatory framework, the, the regulation, not the framework, the regulation. Uh, you can see that it's some of the banks were not adhering to some of the regulations and it's, it can create a, a lot of problems if your financial sector is not regulated very well mm -hmm. because it's a lead economy in a, every economy. Mm -hmm. So cleaning it up is a very good thing. If you look at some other countries, mm -hmm. Argentina and the rest, uh, things like that has created a huge problem for the economy. But I think the Bank of Ghana has done very well. What I'm expecting them to do Consolidating and securing the depositors' fund is a very good thing. Now, because of what has happened, there's a deep in confidence right. in the banking sector, mm. and I think that they have to come out with uh, programs that can bring the confidence back. Because now, if I am taking my money to the bank, mm. I need to be very assured that the bank can keep my money safe mm. and then when I'm going to redraw I don't have any problem. Mm. That is the state we are now that they have done it, they have solidified the capital base is strong now we have to bring the confidence back by coming out with a lot of uh, programs that will tell 
the citizens that oh we have a very good mm. banking sector now where we, we where we were and then now we the banks are stronger they can give good credit and that sort of thing so i think they have to um, give more confidence mm. they have done it the whole program is to instill some confidence in the banking sector right. but i think they should do more to tell every citizen that oh now we have a very safe and sound mm -hmm. secure banking if you look at the microfinance sector they are cleaning up they are paying uh, those debts and mm -hmm. those kinds and that in itself affects the economy right the cleanup has affected the economy so much mm -hmm. that is why i'm saying that they are doing a very good thing what they need to do is to manage the expectations of Ghanaians that the economy was in a, a serious shape, mm. very dire shape. Now they are reorganizing the shape of the economy. Mm. And Ghanaians do need to exercise vision because these things don't take a, a period of uh, let's say about two years or three years. Uh, they need to communicate their communication to mm. tell citizens that we have reorganized the base of the economy. We are trying to do reorganize agriculture, reorganize manufacturing, reorganize the, the financial sector. So these things are going to take some time. So, somebody said on the reverse, the Bank of Ghana uh, sat and watched and didn't properly supervise to allow for things to go south. So yes, they have cleaned up the banking sector, they have cleaned up the microfinance sector, um, they are setting things in place, but they should be telling us what they are doing on the supervisory end exactly. to ensure that you know we don't hit a snag anymore. Is that, think, is that an opinion you agree with? Yes, I think they brought in the, the governance uh, guidelines mm. and then I think the banks are supposed to adhere to. These are signals that tell us that the, 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 the Bank of Ghana is in to regulate the bank. But no, no head rolled at the Bank of Ghana. The bank suffered. That, <laughs> the that is, people, that lost is another, their, people lost their jobs. I think uh, I heard a news item that, uh, is it the finance minister was saying that those who are involved will be brought to book or well, something like it's that? Been, I, it's been how many, how many months <laughs> now? People have lost their jobs. Uh, you know, for of all the banks, uh, whether Royal Bank, whichever bank it is, people have lost their I, jobs. I think we need to do Top that. Top management executives have lost their jobs. Some are, are before the courts. I think we need to do that because elsewhere, if things like that in the financial sector happen, uh, a lot or well, some big senior shots goes mm. to jail. Mm. I mean, because this is the way to keep the system sanitized. Right. If you don't punish and then people can go get away with it. Mm. It becomes a normal thing. And I think that once they have taken the bold step to clean up the system, mm. they should also take a bold step to prosecute anybody who is found guilty of right. anything. Doc, the, the impact of you know the fear that people got from the, the cleanup of the banking sector to, to run to the financial institutions to say, give me back my money. I want to hold my money and, and keep it safe with me. It has affected the economy in a very serious way, hasn't it? Yeah, so, um, yes, uh, it is. I think it was a very difficult decision for this government to make, especially when you came and you met uh, some banks operating far below the minimum capital mm -hmm. you know, requirement. At the time, it was, it had, it was 120 million Ghana cities. Right. You needed that one to, to stay afloat. And uh, most of these banks were working with over uh, below 20 you know, a million Ghana cities. And so if you ask me, they were not, those were not banks. They were, they were already dead, except that we, we have not, a doctor had not pronounced them dead. Okay. And so we thought they were banks, they were not banks. Uh, if a um, Bank of Ghana had not done what they did, mm. uh, by this time, some of them would have collapsed. And that would have been very, very, uh, you know, disastrous if, the, if we had waited for that event to come. You know, that would have even killed I mean, the confidence level would have mm. been zero. Okay. So I think they did it right. And they, in the process, as we really put it, they spent in so much. Let me say that uh, over the last two years, they've spent over 13 billion Ghana cities. Mm. And um, um, I'm using the O series. In the O series, um, if you are debt to GDP ratio, hits 70%. We say your debt is unsustainable. In other mm. words, 
you cannot pay your debt. In other words, you are in HIPIC. As uh, you know, Ghana, <laughs> we went to HIPIC exactly. to the year 2000 mm -hmm. when the debt to GDP ratio was 182. Mm -hmm. If it was 182, what it meant was that you have gone beyond the minimum threshold, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, for, uh, and for that matter, you could not pay your debt. Yeah, you, or if you, <laughs> if you have to pay, you then have to sacrifice some projects, some very good projects of the government mm -hmm. in order to do that. That's, that's, that's the meaning. And um, if you look uh, after HIPIC, our debt situation improved to 20 years. Uh, you know, I mean, percent of GDP in mm -hmm. 2006, mm -hmm. and, and 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 later it went to 32 percent in 2008. Mm -hmm. But um, so let me say that at that time we had huge fiscal, I mean, space, mm -hmm. but uh, we couldn't manage it well. We 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 then went out and bought so much okay. so that by the close of 2016, mm -hmm. debt to GDP ratio had hit 73.1. Mm -hmm. in, indeed, by 2014. Ghana became hippie again because we went beyond the threshold. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to link this to the banking sector thing. And um, uh, if you look at uh, 2000, uh, 2017, when they had to make that decision, uh, Ghana government then had to pay more, had to borrow more, mm -hmm. right? And in the process, they spent uh, around 13 billion Ghana cities. When they did that, the debt to GDP ratio, that would have been 66.5%. In all series, in 2006 constant prices, mm -hmm. that would have been 66.5 percent. Uh, at the end of 2018, mm -hmm. it's 70.7 percent. And so, if you look at our debt situation, debt to GDP ratio is 66.5 without financial sector bailout. Mm -hmm. But if you bring in the money they borrowed to save the financial okay. sector from collapse, from total collapse, we'll thing, it was already collapsing. Okay. And so, someone sometimes Ghanaians are we are too impatient, <laughs> and I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if you have allowed it all the banks to collapse, mm -hmm. that would have been the better option. I don't know. You know, these days people talk as if the decision the Bank of Ghana took is rather that that, uh, that has collapsed the banks. That is not true. Okay. The banks were already dead. They were, the they were already collapsed. In fact, okay. if you were operating beyond your minimum capital adequacy ratio, mm -hmm. it means you, you, are, you, are, you are, I mean, you are insolvent. Mm -hmm. And when you are, once you are insolvent, the laws even say that you should be out of business. And so if mm -hmm. the Bank of Ghana is really up to task at the time, if their monitoring system was working, mm -hmm. they should have closed so many of these banks. They should have closed so many of these microfinancial financial uh, institutions. That is the law. The law says if you become insolvent, you should get out of business. Mm -hmm. So you have no business being in business when you have gone um, insolvent. And so, uh, I mean, I don't understand it. You see, if we don't call a spade by its right name, mm -hmm. we shall forever be where we are in the next 100 years. Ghana will still be where we are. But you know, it, we have to call a spare by a okay. Prof. I think <laughs> this issue of this financial sector mm. thing is not Ghana issue alone. If you go to Kenya, right. the issues that happened here happened there. Mm. I think about two years or even last year, right. it happened there. If you go to South Africa, mm. it happened there. It go to Nigeria, sometime it happened. It tells you about a developing economy and okay. regulations. Right. If we don't regulate the financial sector very well, mm. it is the lead economy and you need to regulate it. If you don't regulate it, it is going to be very bad. Mm. So what the Bank of Ghana did was very, very good. Mm. Now going forward, we need to really sustain the gains, making sure that we still be on the bank and regulate the banking sector very well. Mm. Clean up the microfinance, regulate it very, very well so that the financial sector will be very strong. Yeah. Mm. That nobody get up and then bring in some some money from somewhere that mm. the money is very fictitious and then the banking sector cannot even... The how, how do they get in in the first place? Because yeah, if, no. if, the, if the policing regime is there, <laughs> how do they get in, Doc? Yeah, I, I was trying to make a point that, that uh, Prof has said uh, fa fa finance money mm. is uh, it's like oil that lubricates the engine. Without oil, the engine cannot move. Right. So if you don't have, if your financial sector is bad, the, your economy is also collapsed. Mm. You know, and so uh, the decision that they took, if they have not done that, then the financial sector, the entire financial sector had collapsed. Mm. The entire economy was going to collapse. And so as Prof Riley put it, it's a very good decision. How do they yeah. get in? When, yeah. When when they, so is there, is, is there, is, is there a governor? Is there a governor? You see, uh, if you, um, I mean, the governor receives so much when we are talking about salary. Mm. Eh? And they pay them, government pays them so much, so they will, they will be up to task. Mm. I'm wondering why the, the previous governors slept on their job. They slept on their job and they allowed, you know, so many financial I mean, institutions were coming up 
uh, when they didn't even have what it was to be called banks, they, I mean, they got licenses to uh, operate as banks. That was very bad. You know, I think it's time we, 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 we began thinking about uh, loving this country instead of, uh, you know, some other people. You know, when they are there, they, they want to be good to some people. And in the process, even when you don't have what it is to, because to set up a bank today, mm. the minimum capital requirement is 400 million right. Ghana cities. If right. you don't have it, mm. you don't go to banking. Don't go there. But some people go, uh, those days that was what was happening. Mm. They were able to uh, set up banks when they didn't meet the minimum capital requirement. That was bad. <laughs> that was bad. So that was not a bank in the first place. Mm -hmm. and, and, and unfortunately, to when they came, they, they, they were very reckless. Mm. They were l giving loans to themselves and doing so many things. So as Prof said, I, I don't know what, what, what has kept the, the government so long to punish these people. Mm. They need to be punished so be that punished. it will serve as a deterrent. Okay. <laughs> ah, they need to be punished. That's the conversation here. And uh, Doc uh, is, is upbeat about this particular one. But uh, the question of uh, us paying high, uh, high, higher or realistic rates for our electricity consumption earlier, the government had reduced... Uh, electricity tariffs by some point and then PRC came uh, it went up again now yesterday I picked something from the Facebook page and uh, Instagram um, Twitter page of uh, Mr. Gar Gabi Asara Shridaku a very uh, you know close ally of the government is also uh, well known and he says that well we this year alone government is going to spend one billion dollars to make sure that our lights are on and he's asking, uh, well, would we want to pay some more for electricity just so that money, $1 billion, could be used for other things? That's our next conversation. I invite you to join us with your thoughts and comments on WhatsApp, 020-216-6633. That's 020-216-6633. Would you want to pay more for electricity uh, or would you want to keep enjoying the subsidy? Prof, would you want to pay more? I think it's the... It's the this question should be directed to the PRC. But he's a regulator. Mm. He looks at where the production costs and the distribution and consumption, how much we should pay. Mm. Uh, they would know how much is costing the operators to give us our lights. Mm. And then we'll come out with a realistic uh, charge mm. that we need to pay. But if you should ask me, an mm. ordinary person, I would always like to have a, a lower cost. Okay. Okay. But that is why in a society like this, we have a regulator there so that the operator who is a private person wouldn't uh, increase prices like that. There's also the reverse of the conversation. For example, Anas Arabe Anas uh, did an expose and pointed us in the direction of a lot of major companies that are illegally you know benefiting from our sweat in terms of electricity consumption and how some of them were indebted to ecg at the time now pds now we also know that there are a lot of illegal connections and exactly. we keep talking about it so somebody make the argument that well then what prc brings to us to pay is not necessarily what it is because if people are are still doing illegal connection, people owe you, are not collecting the money. You can't come and lump it and put it on our head to come and pay us realistic rates. It doesn't add up. What do you think? I think it's a right argument. It's, 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 it's looking at the PRC, the PRC should be able to tell the electricity, right now, what's their name? Uh, the power producers, mm. that there are so many inefficiencies that you need to correct. Right. Mm. And then you don't put your inefficiencies on the consumption, mm -hmm. on the consumers. Okay. So if they are coming to increase prices, we should now ask PRC, there are certain inefficiencies. How have they been able to rectify those inefficiencies? Mm -hmm. If they haven't rectified those inefficiencies, I don't think they should pass it on to the consumer. Mm -hmm. And the issue of power, you know, in a, a system like this, it's, we, we say it's a private layer. That is why we sell the electric, electricity corporation now to, mm. so that the private person will bring in that efficiency mm. to produce and then build people who are supposed to build. Mm. And it was not going to go into any government 
uh, premises that is not going to be charged or any factory that is not going to be charged. The private person is in for his uh, or her uh, uh, profit. But the PRC is there to make sure that the private person don't exploit the mm -hmm. consumer. So I think that we should look at the PRC. Mm -hmm. He is the regulator. Okay. And then he should be looking at the inefficiencies and pointing out to mm -hmm. the uh, the power producers or power distributors that look, you have so many inefficiencies. Go and collect it, mm -hmm. go and correct those inefficiencies and rake in the revenue mm -hmm. from those inefficiencies. And then don't charge the the consumer, okay. the household consumer. I so see. I seriously look at the the regulator. It's the okay. same argument with the Bank of Ghana. And even Ghana water. Yeah. In, if if you <laughs> bust pipes, yes. wasting yeah. away water, if and we have to pay. If the regulator, if in a society like this, if the regulator is the the regulator is is politicized, mm -hmm. the the Bank of Ghana, the PRC has certain political influences, mm. then the decision making of the regulator is not very objective. Right. You see, but those regulatory uh, institutions mm. need to be very objective. That is why we make some institution like the Bank of Ghana independent from the Ministry of Finance. Right. See, right. Because they should be independent and they should look at the cracks of the whole thing and come out with what they say. Doc, would you want to pay more or would you want to pay less? Now, I'm asking this question on the, on the strength of this conversation that we started with Prof. Yeah. Essential services, electricity is key. AGI has raised their own question about it because it affects their work largely. Mm -hmm. uh, the barber, the seamstress, the carpenter, everybody uses electricity. Should we pay more? Should we government keep subsidizing? Where should we go? <laughs> Unfortunately, Ghanaian economy is uh, is an emerging market economy, mm -hmm. so usually um, the right price must always be paid at all time. Mm -hmm. But uh, if you ask me, if I were to have uh, the, uh, the 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 power, I would say um, it doesn't make sense for us to pay more because uh, research that we did uh, pushes out there that if uh, ten Ghanaian set up businesses. Mm -hmm. 10 Ghanaian set up businesses. In right. the next five years, six of the businesses mm -hmm. will collapse. Only, only uh, two of the business, um, four of the businesses will survive for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And mostly, uh, in the next 10 years, the only two out of the four mm -hmm. will survive for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And the two that will survive, most of them have uh, political connections. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to be connected to a, a, a political figure mm -hmm. some way, somehow. And so that is one of the main reasons why we are, uh, the economy is not creating jobs because, uh, uh, you know, we, we have cost of credit being high, mm -hmm. we have cost of energy being so high, mm -hmm. and also it is even unreliable. Research has made it clear that um, if we really want uh, more Ghanaians to open up enterprises mm -hmm. for this economy to go to where we want it to be, uh, then uh, cost of credit should go down, right. cost of energy should go down, mm. and we should also uh, make sure energy supply is also what reliable. Mm. And in this country, we are not seeing that. And so, if you ask me, any time uh, electricity goes up by one percentage point the price, mm. it, it means so much to job loss. Right. It means so much, and this is something that we have done. We've done this research over and over with mm. to government, and maybe that is why when Akufuado came, 2017, he tried to reduce, you know, the, I mean, I mean the tariffs. Mm. And if it, it is going back again, then we are going back to where we were. So I would have with the government intervenes to make sure uh, we manage it uh, the way it is, and and see because now we have seen the, the, the argument that we, we have seen the manufacturing one, sector. One billion dollars, it, it could have. Built schools, it could have built a factory, it, and it could have constructed roads. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, yeah, that's it. Uh, you, so they are right. They are right. So we have to pay the, I mean, you know, realistic tariffs. Mm. But uh, they have to be very careful uh, if you pay uh, realistic tariffs. It's not going to have adverse consequences for, for the manufacturing sector. Okay. That we need it to work, uh, to, I mean, to perform so well mm. so that. For example, we produce more to, to, to replace the imports, mm. uh, to strengthen our city. And, and as we do that, 
in the process, we're also creating more jobs. Mm. And so, what, what do you want? What do you want? You know, it's, 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 it's all about what you want. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Albert Puni. He is with the UPSA, the University of Professional Studies here in Accra. He is with the Corporate Governance Leadership and Business Administration Faculty. He's joined us here. Prof, thank you very much for your time. Prof says, let's uh, the regulator fix the inefficiencies and stop passing it on to all of us. Uh, Yabre. And uh, Dr. George Domfe is a Senior Research Fellow, Development Economist from the University of Ghana. Doc, thank you very much for your time. Doc says, let's keep it the way it is now. Let's be very careful the way it is. What do you think? Should we pay more? Should we pay less? Uh, your credit on ACG and you know, PDS credit, should you pay more? Should you pay less? Water as well?